If you've ever had a PET scan, then you've absorbed the tracer fluorine 18. This is a radioactive substance, and it's absorbed by certain cells. Uh, we use it to detect glucose, intense radio labeling where there is high glucose uptake, and it gets trapped there until it decays radioactively. We use this for diagnosing uh, different types of cancers, and the most common types, uh, according to this unsighted source, are Hodgkin's lymphoma, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and lung cancer. So it's really important. We use this in, in uh, science, in medicine. It has some effective radiation dose. They're really careful about how much they put inside our body, how much will decay. But it does follow all the principles of exponential decay. So here we go. We've got a cup of this fluorine 18. What do we mean when we say it decays? We mean that it either undergoes alpha, positive beta decay, negative beta decay, or gamma decay. Fluorine 18 happens to go through positive beta decay. So let's see if we can write out that formula, that equation. We've got the fluorine 18, which has nine protons. Okay, we know it's gonna give off a positive beta particle, plus one, zero. And positive beta, let's think about the time axis. We haven't really learned Feynman diagrams, but there's some squiggly line that we're going to see. We know one principle. If you create new matter, then you also have to create antimatter in the same step. So we can draw antimatter with a backwards arrow in time, just because it's different, it's anti. And regular matter we can draw with a forwards arrow. So let's see, positive beta, that's like an electron but opposite. Oh yeah, so that means it's antimatter. So then are we producing a neutrino or an antineutrino? Well, we're going to produce a neutrino because you need one antimatter and one matter particle. <clears throat> All right, so then this last thing here is going to be a neutrino, regular old neutrino. And this is going to turn into oxygen. We have to balance the total mass number, or nucleon number. So I've got 0, 0. Well, it has to add on the right side. It has to add to equal the left side. That's 18. So this will be 18, because 18, 0, and 0 make the same value as what we have on the left. And we also have to balance the proton number. And so we've got 1 here, so we only need 8 here to get up to the total of 9 on the left. The total left side equals the total right side. <clears throat> so there's the decay equation. That's what happens in our body, and we use it as a tracer. We detect, uh, we detect cells that take up glucose. There's a second thing we mean when we say it is radioactive. We also mean it follows the half-life principle. So if you wait one half-life, and for fluorine, 18, the half-life is three days. Nice round number. So if we wait one half-life, what happens? Well, half of the fluorine will decay into the oxygen. Here's the oxygen. I'll write, draw the oxygen in green. And if we wait another half-life, again, let three more days pass. Again, half of that oxygen, oh, sorry, half of the fluorine that remains, half of the half will decay. And where, what did it decay into? Where did it go? Sometimes we say it dis disintegrates. Well, it decays into oxygen. And so for each particle, there's another, you know, a beta, positive beta particle getting ejected. There's another anti, uh, sorry, another neutrino. For each decay that occurs, this process happens for every single little nucleus that decays. If we wanted to note an equation, we start with some number n0, and the number n that remains after one half-life is n0 times a half. If we let two half-lives pass, here's how much remains. If we let three half-lives pass, Here's how much remains. 
It feels like we should write this as an exponent, doesn't it? A half to the power of 2, a half to the power of 3. I mean, that's going to be a lot easier than just writing a half over and over and over. Let's see if we can get this down as an exponent. What would the exponent be? If I put in the amount of time that passes, three days, and then next I'll put in as the exponent, six days, let's assume six days passes. Well, three days should mean that we multiply by one half to the one, right? When the exponent, when, when, the, when the time that passes, if t is equal to three days, we want the whole exponent to become 1, and when t is equal to 6 days, 2 half-lives, we want the whole exponent to become a 2, and so forth. If we let t, the amount of time, be 9 days, we want the whole exponent to just become 3, so that we multiply by a half 3 times. That's 3 half-lives. So we have to divide by the half-life. We have to take the amount of time that passes and divide by the half-life to get the true formula. So what is the general equation? We're taking how much we start with, n0, that's the initial amount, multiplying by a half, raising it to the power of the time that passes, divided by the half-life little t, the time that passes, over the half-life. And this formula makes a lot of sense, because if the time that passes, little t, if it equals one half-life, then we expect the entire exponent after one half-life, it should just become one, so that we're only multiplying the amount by a half once. Is that what happens? Yes, that's what happens. If you substitute in the value 1, you know, 1 times t half, then the halves, the t1 halves cancel, and the exponent just becomes a 1. If we let two half-lives pass, what do we expect the equation to do? We expect it to multiply by a half twice, because two half-lives passed. Alright, is that what happens? We plug in 2 times t1 half, the t1 halves cancel in the numerator and denominator. We're left with just the 2. And, oh yeah, if we raise a half to the power of 2, then it's like multiplying by a half twice. Be why, is it, why are we multiplying a half twice? Because two half-lives passed. So this formula makes a lot of sense. This is exactly what we expect. Something you're going to need to be able to do for the extra credit opportunity is convert into a new base. Now, I, you might have seen the exponential decay equation before, maybe in your math class. And I want to, I, so I'm going to make that the new base I convert into. That's not what you're going to do for your extra credit opportunity. But, you know, it's a good example for me to show before you try it on your own. So, okay. I want to express this formula again. But I want to have, instead of base 1 half, base E. E is Euler's number. It's like 2.7, blah, blah, blah. But I'm not really sure what the exponent will be. Let's figure out what that exponent needs to be. If you want to convert into base e, well, first let's just divide both sides by n0. You'll see why we do this in a moment. It's going to make it easier to use our log rules. Then, if we want to convert into base e, take the log base e, n over n0, log base e, 1 half to the power of t divided by the half-life, where little t is the time that passes. We could write this as ln, uh, I'm just writing it this way for thoroughness, I suppose. Okay, we have an, a log rule that says you can take the exponent and put it out front as a coefficient. So let's apply that log rule. And now, by the way, that's why I moved n0 to the other side. 
if n0 were still stuck inside here, you know, you can't use that rule. You would have to do something else first. So this is simpler. Okay, so I've got the exponent, the time passing over the half-life. That's out front now. That's the coefficient now. Log base e, one half. Now I'm going to take this log statement and turn it back into an exponent. The base raised to this mess, raised to that power, is equal to what we're logging. E to the this, you know, black raised to the power of green equals purple. So let me write that out. E to the power of t over t one half times ln, I'll write it out as ln now, of one half equals n over n zero. Hey, this is super convenient. See how I, I kept the these as a fraction? Now I can just multiply both sides back by n zero, and it's going to return to the original form that I had at the very beginning. e to the power of t times, <clears throat> let's see, let me write it this way, e to the power of this is such a mess, ln one half over t one half times little t. We define this mess, this first coefficient in the exponent, we define it as the negative decay constant. Lambda is something called the decay constant, and it is simply equal to negative ln one half over t one half. But remember our log rule. This is this is not really relevant to the process you're going to be following. But I just want to point out you can take that negative one, make it an exponent, make it an exponent, and one half to the power of negative one is just two. Ln two over t one half. This is a formula that you see in physics textbooks, and now we've actually derived it which is pretty cool. You have to do a similar derivation. Um, <clears throat> you're not going to have to go through this business, but here is your task. Let's start with a billion dice. We roll them all. We remove any dice, any die that shows a one on it. So you start with the original amount, and after one roll, t will be the number of rolls. After one roll, we've multiplied by 5 sixths. After two rolls, we multiply by 5 sixths when t is 1. When t is 2, we multiply by 5 sixths twice. After three rolls, we multiply by 5 sixths three times. But wait a second, this is just the value of t. How many rolls we've done? So the general equation is n equals no times 5 sixths to the t. This whole thing is raised to the power of t. Again, where t is the number of rolls. With each time, you know, each, each time you roll the dice, you take out the ones, you have 5 sixths remaining. The question for you is what is the half-life of dice? To answer this question, you're going to have to change the base. But what do you change it to? Something for you to think about. Where do you see, once you successfully change the base, how do you find what the half-life is from that new crazy expression? Well, look back to this earlier example. The half-life is the denominator. It's what t gets divided by when the base is 1 half. So give it a shot. We've gone through one example now of changing the base. We know how that process works. We know the tricks we need. Change the base, find the half-life, and I'll go ahead and, uh, you know, you calculate it. Uh, this is an extra credit opportunity. I'll go ahead and tell you the half-life comes to, if I recall correctly, it's about 3.8. Good luck. <laughs>